Good morning and welcome again to worship here at Central United Methodist Church Kings Mountain. We're joining you over Facebook today. And I pray that as we come together that there's a lot of fear, a lot of unrest around us. And so we're better to find rest, we're better to find peace than find it in a community of faith, uh, studying the Word of God, hearing God's promises for us. Uh, but before we start this morning, just a few things to, uh, that I do need to mention to you is over the next three weeks, I think you've received the email, or if you haven't, uh, here are going to be our schedule for the next couple weeks. We're going to be meeting outside, weather permitting, as much as we can for live worship starting at 9 o'clock a.m. Uh, on Sunday mornings. We'll meet in the parking lot. Social distancing is required. Also, wearing a mask if you're compromised in any way. We want to encourage you to simply join us over Facebook. It, uh, we don't want to exclude anyone, but we want to include all those that we can in, um, in our worship. As we go forward, I thank you for being flexible. Uh, we're, make, we're changing time sometimes, and I know that's frustrating for you, but we're trying to meet the changing needs that we have, the changing demands. And as we go forward, I pray that God will lead all of us and as we come this morning, let us uh, certainly remember uh, the folks that are, are hurting this morning, uh, the folks are feeling frightened. Let us, uh, let us ask God to be present with us. Can we do that? Let's pray together. Come, Lord Jesus, into our midst, bringing your Holy Spirit. Coming, O God, to empower us, strengthen us, but most of all, to teach us. To teach us to be like you, to love others as we have loved ourselves. And I pray this morning, O oh Lord, that as we come, that as we hear your word proclaimed in song, as we hear your word proclaimed from your scriptures, heal us this morning, heal our land, guide our leaders, and in all things, O oh Lord, be present with us in the name of Christ. Amen and amen. As we come to the time of prayer this morning, I do want to recommend something to you. Our district superintendent, Angela Pleasance, I love Angela. She has done such an incredible job here. We really hate to lose her for the Catawba district. She's going back into the local church, but she has penned an excellent article uh, that we have posted on our Facebook uh, account. If you're not able to get that, um, let me know and, and I will send that to you in, in 
uh, hard form, but she does an incredible job of articulating both sides of an issue that is plaguing our country today. Uh, I recommend that to you heartily. This morning, I want to remember all those folks that are experiencing the fear, the, the rioting, the looting, the, um, just the unrest that seems to permeate our, uh, our nation. Here in Kings Mountain, folks have peacefully protested, and I think that's an incredible thing. Kings Mountain has done a really good job of, of integrating, uh, and we can do a better job, but uh, we just need to work on that a bit. But this morning as we come, let us also remember those who are sick, uh, those who have lost loved ones, those who are separated, and continue to remember, we forget that we're in the midst of this uh, pandemic. In the midst of that, come Lord, would you come? Would you join me in prayer? The psalmist prayed, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He leadeth me beside the still waters. There are many things that the psalmist has told us in Psalm 23. He recounts his story of a loving God that even in the midst of his greatest trial leads him even through the valley of the shadow of death. But the psalmist was not afraid. I pray this morning, O oh God, that as we come to you, we, our land needs healing. Our land needs Jesus. I pray this day, O oh Lord, that as we have come into this place to worship, as we worship together across this land, may we recommit dedicating ourselves, O oh God, to the call you have placed upon our life, dedicating ourselves, O oh God, to treating one another equally, of loving one another, even as you have loved us. I pray for our police officers. I pray for those this morning, O oh God, who are protesting, that you would keep both sides safe. I pray this morning, O oh Lord, that in the midst of this, that our leaders might be both sympathetic and empathetic. And I pray, O oh God, that in the midst of this, that understanding might come as we discuss that which is before us. But most of all, O oh Lord, I pray for a touch from your Holy Spirit as we continue to experience Pentecost. The disciples were drawn together by your Holy Spirit that entered that upper room that worked among them. So I pray, O oh God, that you would work among the, us in that way also. Teach us to love one another, whatever our differences may be. And teach us, O oh God, that there are no winners and losers. There are only losers when people do not love one another. So this morning, O oh God, I want you to teach us. Teach us your ways, teach us your precepts, and teach us to pray as you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen.
know this little song that we have learned from from childhood I remember going into the rooms of folks that are have severe dementia and as I go in to pray with them and as I go in to visit with them sometimes we would sing with them and one of the little songs that we would sing is this song Jesus loves me this I know and even in the midst of however far away they may be in their mind you could see their lips moving and they would be singing this song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves us, loves me still today, walking with me all the way, wanting as a friend to give light and love to all who live. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. And in that third verse, Jesus loves this, we say, caring for us every day. Troubles to him all belong. We are weak, but he is strong. This morning from Romans, from chapter 8, starting with verse 26. I want you to hear these words with me as we hear them uh, said to us this morning. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is condemned. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life nor death nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, 
nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Truly, God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. We are weak, but he is strong. No truer words were ever written in a song and has such a deep theological basis. Another way that you could sum this up is life is tough, but God is good and God is faithful and God is tougher than life will ever be. So the first thing that we need to know that as we look at this passage this morning is that God knows us. God knows us. He knows you and God knows me. And of course the word here that is used is predestined and so sometimes that word is sort of manipulated around and not really understood but it's there we have to deal with it so if God knows all these things and God causes these things to happen it's predestined but let's look at that word just a minute I found it interesting that uh, this word predestined is more in Wesley's view of, of salvation Wesley had these steps to salvation, his ordo salutis. And one of the things that, uh, the first thing is provenient grace, the grace that goes before, that calls us into a relationship with God. I think that Wesley's idea of, of provenient grace and Paul's idea of predestination, they seem to line up for me. God knew, God knew where we were going before we were ever born. And God started making plans for our arri arrival. It's like a couple who plans to have children and there are various, I mean, they sit down and they have goals. And some, I know some folks that are so, um, so obsessed that they plan out every stage of their child's life. And in fact, before that child's ever born, they have decided where that child is going to college and what they will do for a vocation. Choosing a name for Deborah and I was hard. I, I don't know how folks choose about the rest of that, but we talked and we talked and we talked about simply choosing a name for the longest time. And we started preparing. We started creating the space for, for our children. We started uh, and we were wondering, would it be a boy or would it be a girl? And, and this was before the days of ultrasound. And so, uh, and even up to the last minute, we were wondering, uh, was this child going to be a boy? And, and gratefully and thankfully, we had two daughters, beautiful daughters. And I am so thankful for that. And when God gave that bundle, I, I realized that all the plans that I had made were out the window. <laughs> they were out the window because as our children began to grow, I realized that there, there was something that I had not counted on. I had not allowed it to work its way into the equation of my plan. And that was that these children would have a mind and a will of their own. They would make their own choices. There were a lot of decisions to make along the way. And it's really interesting that some of those decisions were made about uh, because of the maturity level of our children at different places in their life. God foreknew. God knows us. God created us, and he created us with a unique personality, but something God gave all of us. He, he has known us from the very beginning, and in the ways he has created us, he has loved us with, a, with an incredible love. And wherever we have been, God has already been there before us, so God knows what's coming later. We don't know. Now, some of us that have lived as long as I've lived, we have life experiences, but I have to tell you that I, I've often said, I've, you know, I don't think that there's anything that I haven't seen in life, and then something will happen in the church that I've never seen or heard before so I, I have not experienced it all I have not seen it all but God has been there God has experienced it and that's what I think Paul means with this word predestined God knows he he knows the past he knows the present and he knows the future and as we walk through that 
that God is, God is setting us up to succeed, but then God has something that he's given us free will. He's given us choice, but he's, he's given us the gift of a, of a relationship, but we have the ability. And this is, this is where it gets really interesting, that we have the ability to say yes or no to that relationship. Wow, that's, that's a great deal of authority, isn't it? That God will give us the ability to say yes or no to something that important. We are known. God knows us. God created us. He knit us together. He knows every fiber of our being, and he has laid claim to us. Paul tells us that we have been called and we have been claimed by God. We're called... We're called, and that, that's the only way to get to God. It's like two people standing on the opposite side of the river. One is sick, and the other has the cure, and the cure can't be given and received until the two come together that that person receives the cure. Um, there's a, a little song, that a gospel song. Uh, Jesus built a bridge, so that, uh, and he is the bridge that we might cross that gap that we're standing on one side and and we have a we have a disease it's called sin and God's standing on the other side of that gap and he has the cure which is called grace and salvation and we need a way in which that that we can bridge that gap Jesus built a bridge and Jesus is the bridge whether you think the story of Adam and Eve is a true story or an allegory, I, I'm not going to get lost in that argument. It, it, I will say to you that no matter how hard human beings try to fix this problem that we exist with, this uh, hate and this mistrust, this, this ability to hurt one another, and it's, it's always going to exist until, 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 hear that word until, that the world knows the power and the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. A bridge God built with three nails and two pieces of wood. With three nails and two pieces of wood, Jesus built our bridge. And resurrection, in resurrection we move from simply being called and claimed to being cured. Now I've had some things in my life that were chronic ailments that I, I wish that someone could do something about. And there have been times that doctors have been able to offer a cure. But there's an ailment that I've had for a long time that no doctor has been able They've, ne they've never developed a medicine for it. It's sin. But sin no longer has a claim on my life because I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and I pray that that's what you are looking for and that you're developing. John Hopkins University years ago did a, a survey. They sent a group of people out to the city slums to interview 200 boys. And on the basis of their findings, what they wanted to do in this survey, they wanted to try to predict the future. Do you know how hard that is? They wanted to predict the future of these 200 young men that were living in the slums. Shocked by what they saw in the slums and how these young men were living and how that they were acting, they came back and their prediction was, now listen to this, their prediction was 90% of those boys that they interviewed, of those 200 they interviewed, that 90% of those boys would be incarcerated. They would spend time in prison. And 20 years later, they sent a, John Hopkins sent another group out into the same slums to locate the boys or the survivors of the boys and to see how life had turned out for them. And of the 
boys that they could find. They found over 180. Uh, so there are only 20 short of, of the original. But of the 180 they found, they found that only four of them had been to jail, had been to prison. So why had the, why had their predictions proven to be so false? They had, they had predicted 90%, but now only four of those men. They found um, a common denominator. Over a hundred of those young men remembered a teacher that they'd had in school, a, a Miss O'Rourke, that she had had a tremendous influence on them. And actually, after a long search, they finally found this Miss O'Rourke in a nursing home in Memphis, Tennessee. And they, they recounted the survey and they recounted what they had done and, and they said to, to this woman, what did you do? How is it that you could influence these young men so much that only four out of these uh, 180 that we found had ever been to jail? And she was puzzled. And she thought about it for a moment and, she, and so she said to the researchers, all I ever did was love them. And that's all that I think that Jesus ever did for us. As I think about the world, we're told over and over and over about what a terrible world this place is. But I think about the people I know. I know some folks that, that have lived very difficult lives. Very difficult lives. But I know a lot of wonderful people. I know a lot of people that have done incredible things for me and have shaped my life. All they ever did was love me. And you know what, you know what the common denominator in most of those folks are? Is they know Jesus. They, they were influenced by the love of Jesus. Loves, God loves us with an unconditional love. This sin that we have is incurable. Without the power and love of God, this, this, this sin that we have is not humanly possible to cure it. But because of the bridge that Jesus bridged between us and God, it is a, there is a cure, and it's called salvation. We have been claimed by God, and so God, God has already laid claim to us. We've been called, and God has laid his claim on us. And once God has called and claimed us, he holds us and he strengthens us. I've prayed many times about things. Uh, I, I realize in my life, one of my issues is sometimes I don't know how to pray. Oh, I've been trained. I've been trained to pray and I've been trained to, to articulate with some wonderful words and I sometimes I write my prayers out so that they will there will be long flowing sentences. But I read a story one time about a, a woman that as she tucked her 11 year old daughter into bed at night, uh, the daughter looked up and, and she said to her mother, mother, let's, let's pray for my friend Amy. Amy is, her hair is falling out and, and she just, she's sick, mom. I, I wanna pray. And so the little girl began to pray and she prayed in a way, it breaks my heart. It, she prayed in a way that was so powerful. God, please keep the hair on Amy's head. That was her understanding of how to pray. God keep the hair on Amy's head. And for weeks, they continued that prayer. God, please keep the hair on Amy's head. But then after some testing and after uh, the little girl had been to the doctor several times, they found she, that she has a condition called alopecia. It's a condition where that uh, your hair just falls out. Your your body attacks the hair follicles, and so uh, it's permanent. There's not anything they can do to reverse it or stop it. And so mom sat on the edge of that little girl's bed, and she tried to explain to her, uh, Amy has, uh, there's something going on with Amy's body, and, and so her hair is not going to stay uh, on her head. 
So the little girl thought about that for a minute. And she changed her prayer. She said, dear Lord, if you're not going to hold the hair on Amy's head, then please just hold Amy. Wow. Out of the mouth of babes, I guess. And that's what God does. Even when we sometimes are praying perhaps in the wrong direction or we're, we think that God is not listening, we need to understand that God may not be giving us what we're praying for, but God is holding us nevertheless. The good news is, is that once that we're called and claimed by God, then God holds us in whatever situation in life that we may face. There's a poem by W.H. Alden. Uh, it's called The Funeral Blues. And here's how it goes. He was my north, my south, my east, my west, my working week and my Sunday rest, my noon, my midnight, my talk, my song. I thought love would last forever. I was wrong. I think that poem is wrong. Perhaps Alden here is talking about the human's ability to love and uh, and human love is as wonderful as it is is sometimes it has its uh, faults and it has fallibilities with it it's fallible it's flighty sometimes when Paul is talking here in Romans Paul is talking about a godly love an unconditional love a love that never lets what can what can take us from God's hand nothing let us stay let us stay embraced in the love of God Love binds us to Christ, and Christ is the bridge that bridges the gap from us to God so that he is the, also the cure for what ails us, sin. So Paul says nothing will separate us. Nothing, nothing in this life will overcome us if we hold on. So what does he mean? I think it may be in these phrases in the face of death there's resurrection remember that folks in the face of death there's resurrection in the face of illness there is healing eternal healing in the face of danger there's the right arm of God the, the strength of God to hold us in the face of adversity there's blessed assurance in the face of confrontation there's confidence in the face of sin there's the gift of the cross and the blood of Christ. In the face of temptation, there's Christ's faithfulness. In the face of greed, there's abundant life. We don't have to live that way. There's life. In the face of hunger, there is a legacy of the loaves and fishes. In the face of hardship, there is the promise of goodness. In whatever comes our way, God holds us and holds us close to himself and provides the strength that we need for whatever we're facing in a particular moment. And some of the things that we face are so incredibly hard. God calls us, he claims us, and he asks us to be conformed to his image. There's a man that lives in Hawaii. I don't know if you know this, but uh, when Monday Night Football comes on, we're watching it at, at 9 o'clock, 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, but there's a difference. that they, It doesn't come on in Hawaii. Uh, it, in Hawaii, it's still mid-afternoon when it's coming on here. And so they wait to televise in Hawaii Monday Night Football. And so... Um, This man would always uh, knew that there was a delay in watching television, and but there were some days that he had a particular team that he wanted that he was listening to, and so he couldn't wait. To, he couldn't wait to see who won, and he would he would always um, check in to see the scores. And even though he knew who won, if it was his team, he was elated, and he watched the game. He watched the entire game with elation, with with gladness. But if his team lost, he found ways that he could be consoled. And uh, 
that he could take the, the sting of loss. One of the things I love about the Bible, I, I, I love this chapter in, in Romans. For all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and live according to his purposes. You know, the book of Revelation in our Bible, in the, it, 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 I think some of the problems we have sometimes is we look at the Bible only in snapshots, but I like to look at the Bible in totality. I need to tell you a secret. No matter what trouble we have in this world, no matter what comes our way, I, I know some things and I want to share them with you this morning and then I'll finish. I want you to know that you've been called by God. I want you to know that God has a claim upon your life. I want you to know that whatever adversity that you face in life, that God is, uh, that God has already has been there and he knows what it is. Cling to him, hold on to him, and whatever it may be that in the eternal plan of whatever God has for us, you see, I've cheated a little bit. I've read the end. I know what's coming. Like that man that watched the football game, I know what's coming in the end. And you know what the Bible tells me? Though no matter what Satan may think, no matter what may be going on in this world. And you need to know this. In the end, God wins. And because we are children of God and claimed and called by God, held by God, strengthened by God because God wins, and we've been cured of this terrible disease called sin, ultimately we are the big winners. Because in the end, we win. Let us pray. Come, Lord Jesus, come and be present with us this day. Come, O oh Lord, and follow us, hold us, and let us feel the assurance of your love today. Father, this morning, if we do not know you, if we have been going through trouble and we've been trying to care for ourselves through our own strength, let us know, oh God, that there's not a great chasm that exists anymore. There's a bridge from where we are to where God is, and his name is Jesus. Let us claim him this morning, and let us follow him. that from the depth of our heart that we might know the love of God. Amen and amen. As we go forward this week, folks, may the love, peace, and grace of Christ go before you, and may you feel God's love, whatever it is in life that you're experiencing. Amen and amen.